What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another YouTube video showcasing more of Pico CTF 2022. We are diving back in, and we are on the second half of the fourth page, everybody. We've done, like, what, 42 videos thus far? 66 challenges in Pico, so we are cruising through it. Hopefully, we can get a, get a bit more in. So I'll hop over to my computer screen, and we'll check out this next challenge we have in front of us. We're working in the binary exploitation category, and this challenge is called Buffer Overflow 2. We do need to launch a dedicated instance for this. It says control the return address and the argument arguments. Ooh, so now part of me wonders, is this going to be a 32-bit or a 64-bit challenge? We have a Netcat connection to go work with the remote application, but we have the program and the source code. It says this time you'll just need to control the arguments, the function you return to. So sure thing, let's go ahead and download these. I'll hop over to my terminal here. I do still have some leftovers from the previous video, so let me close out those. Oh, that's Ghidra over off on the side here. But Let's move into the binary exploitation category. Let's make a directory for buffer overflow two. And we know we want to get to the comp one we have not yet completed, the new machine. And I totally lost what was in my clipboard. Uh, so let's go grab that one more time. I'll grab the source, W get that down. We'll grab the binary, W get that down. And let's see if we can beat the clock and solve this thing before our 30 minutes are up. I just opened the binary on accident. I do want to look at the source code in my text editor, so vuln.c. And it looks like, okay, kind of the same structure and setup as all of the previous things we've been working on. But uh, our win function actually takes argument one and argument two. Hmm. Okay. So it'll return the flag. It'll actually print it only if we can get past these two checks. If argument one is not equal to cafe food, then we bail out. Hex cafe food, right? Zero X C A F E F zero zero D. Uh, if R2 is not equal to food food, then it returns. The program uh, function bails out and we won't actually see the flag printed out for us. So, okay, uh, we have to make sure we supply those arguments. Have our vuln function, of course, with gets, also puts, and uh, enter our string, it calls the vuln function. So, pretty good, pretty easy for us to work with. Is this a 32-bit program? It is. So, we can get into how 32-bit calling conventions work in Linux, right? Let me dig into this. I wanna look for 32-bit calling convention. 32-bit, uh, do, 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 do. I'm just gonna control F here and there. Pascal is not what we're doing. Mm, is it C decal or syscall? No. Nah. Syscall is a center calling convention for OS2 API. Uh, we must be in C decal. Mm. Let me go take a look here. Oh, yeah. Okay, this one it should be. The C declaration is a calling convention that originates from Microsoft's compiler for the C programming language and is used by many C compilers for the x86 architecture. Now, hey, let me dive into this for just a quick second. The, real, the reason that I just speed run over to the C calling conventions is because we are calling a function after all. We are going to end up running our new flag or win function to get the flag, but the arguments and how they're passed to that function are specified in some specific way when we get in that low level binary exploitation stuff. Uh, sure, it just happens naturally when our program runs, but because we are now controlling the program, like as an attacker or someone that we do something different with our buffer overflow exploit, we wanna be able to make it do what we want. So we will have to pass it arguments to functions that we wanna call. That's why we're checking out the calling conventions. Sorry, just a disclaimer, right? In the C declaration, subroutine arguments are passed on the stack. Integer values and memory addresses are returned in the EAX register. Okay, so that's the return address where it's stored. We don't need to worry about that one specifically in this case, but we do need to worry about the fact that our arguments are passed on the stack. In the context of the C programming languages, function arguments are pushed on the stack in right to left order. In other words, the last argument is pushed first. Mm. Consider the following C source code snippet. So we have a callee function and a caller. So the caller function will call with arguments one, two, and three, 
and then add five to it at the very, very end. So if we were to actually take a look at what this looks like in assembly, here's our caller function. We have a new stack frame or a call frame. We have basically what we consider a function prologue, where you'll see this just about all the time for when you look at the assembly of how a function is being written out. We push the base pointer so we can keep track of the previous call frame or the stack frame, right? And we set the base pointer to be the stack pointer. So we save the original call frame, but now we're just reassociating or reorienting ourselves for the current stack frame, yeah? And then we push the call arguments in reverse. That means three would be pushed on the stack first, two would be pushed on the stack second, and then one would be pushed on the stack last. And we see that, we see that exactly, hey, in this assembly code. So if we were to call callee just following it, that means that the things uh, most closest to it are the furthest uh, arguments that are pushed on the stack. So when we try to overwrite the return address, we'll need to make sure that the ones that follow it are where we want to return after that function exits and then the arguments that follow in the reverse order. Does that make any sense whatsoever? <laughs> we'll write it out in code and we'll see it here. The way that we could probably speed run this process for us is by trying to copy um, our specific exploit script. But let's do something a little bit different actually. Let's, uh, yeah, you know what, let's do it. I'm gonna copy our original buffer overflow one exploit.python script and we can modify it. But I realize, sure, this is gonna do this all kind of remotely for the time being, but I wanna play with this locally. And the best way to do that is to honestly level up some of our binary exploitation techniques yet again. Uh, I know we introduced Jeff in like the last binary exploitation video trying to get more cool stuff in our debugger. Now let's make our Python scripting a little bit better and our CTF playing and bin X and reverse engineering stuff better with pwn tools. It's finally time. We'll crack it open. We'll go grab pwn tools. If you haven't heard of this thing, it is the coolest thing since sliced bread. Pwn Tools is a capture the flag framework and exploit development library. Written in Python, it's designed for rapid prototyping and development and making exploits writing as simple as possible. We can just go ahead and download it, super easy. Here are these documentations at docs.pwntools.com, but I'll give you a crash course super duper quick. What you'll end up doing is you'll install it with your Python package installer, like pip. Pip3, because we're using Python 3, install Pwn Tools. In my case, I already have it installed, forgive me. So if I were working in Python 3, here I just am, I'm in the interpreter, manual interaction, right? If I imported Pwn, that library is now something that I can work with. And I know it's called Pwn Tools, but the way that we import it in scripts is going to be import Pwn. Now we can do a couple different things with this. Um, let's basically, yeah, let, 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 let's basically delete this whole thing. <laughs> uh, rather than import socket and import struct, let's import pwn. We'll keep arg parse because maybe we want to do some, some strange shenanigans. But if we imported pwn, what we could do is we could actually go ahead and specify a local binary that we might want to work with. We could specify that as like an elf file, yeah? So elf can be a pwn dot capital ELF, ELF, and then we can specify the path to the program that we want to be working with. In this case, it's Voln, right? That Voln ELF file that we just downloaded. Now, the reason that I do this is because we could actually wrap around the whole idea of the binary. Rather than trying to hard code where that win function was or where that flag function is, we could actually go find it with Python using some symbol lookups. Really, really cool. Actually, let me do that. We've got this elf file. Let's print it out. Let me print out elf, and uh, I will go ahead and split this display here. Run it. It'll automatically run checksec, which is one of those command line utilities. We even saw it in the previous uh, blog post we were reading. You could use checksec on a binary 
and it will tell you, hey, this is a 32-bit architecture. There is no stack canary. We do have NX enabled, so we can't really execute shellcode off the stack, but we can bebop around with return addresses. No position independent executable, partial railroad, whatever, whatever. This gives us an idea and baselines, okay, what should we be doing for exploitation? What's accessible to us? What's not? What's realistic? What's feasible? CheckSec is good to do, and Pwn Tools will just automatically do that for us. Now, I mentioned we would be able to go ahead and determine where we might see that win function. Now, we can only do this, right, because, hey, we know this vuln function is not stripped. It's still keeping track of the symbol names for where they are in the binary. With that said, I could actually print out, okay, we know we want the win function up here. Where's the address for that? Let's index it through dot symbols and let's print that out. And there's this big decimal value that's just churned out. But of course, hey, we're gonna represent that in, in hex. And now you have the memory address, the location. Where in the binary is this present? It's at 8049296. Okay, you might press the I believe button on that, but let's keep in mind, what if we were to use read elf on our vuln? Where is our win function? Oh, 8049296. Mm, that is the advantage of using our pwn tools library right away, because sure, we can actually access that super duper easy. Now, what if we wanted to interact with this program locally rather than just trusting, hey, we're gonna throw stuff at the remote and we'll never know or see if we get a seg fault or not. Here's what we could do. We could actually specify a new variable and take our elf binary and run it as a process. I'm just gonna call it P for the quick and easy sake of, hey, we could type that pretty quick. But then if I run p.elf process, what we could do is we could say p.interactive and then we can suddenly interact with it at any point where we want to. While we could still do weird stuff like, oh, send data to the program or receive data, just as if it were a remote socket connection, but just holding onto it locally. So that's kind of cool. Uh, here, let's p receive. Um, in fact, we don't even need arguments to that. Normally you pass in like a boilerplate, oh, 4096, hey, Pwn tools will do that for you. We can just print out what we receive. Let's try and run that now. I'll do it from the uh, script here. Boom, okay, I made a mistake. Actually, it's gonna tell us right away after we ran check sec, ooh, we can't execute this thing because it's not marked as executable. Good catch, thank you, Pwn tools. Let's use chmod plus x vuln and then try and run our script and boom. It says, hey, please enter your string with new lines. Note that it is in bytes, so you have a B prefix before these string quotes, and we enter interactive mode. Very, very cool. If you wanted to decode this so it is no longer bytes and it's just a real string, you could do that just as well. Uh, and I'll have to hit Control C to break out of that on my keyboard. Control C to quit the program. Please enter your string starting interactive mode. So we can interact with it, like AAAA, and it would print it out for us, and then and the application. Okay, good enough, right? Now I wonder, there is a super duper cool way to hook this thing to GDB. Um, and I think, let's, let's throw caution in the wind here and let's try it. Let's, let's go ahead and create a process and see if we can hook it to GDB. Uh, GDB attach based off of it? Or can I do it just based off of an elf? Um, let's try it. GDB can equal, I'll call it G. How about elf.gdb? Can I do that? Will it let me? Run it from Python. Elf has no attribute GDB. Okay. Let's make the process and let's use pwn.gdb attach to P. Does that work? Ooh, ooh, look at that, look at that. So it popped up a new window and it won't actually do it. Hey, we attached the program, couldn't get registered, no such process, so did it die? Can I run it? It does, it does still let me run it. 
So very, very cool. You could use GDB init to set up anything that you might like, like pass in arguments to stage a lot of your GDB processing, or we could still debug it locally as needed through our script and maybe I'll automate some portions of it. Super duper cool, super duper handy. Good to be able to synthesize both our script, our debugger, and all of our exploitation in one place. Anyway, we know we've done all this cool stuff, right? We have a process. We can receive information, we can make it go interactive, but we want to exploit this thing. Let's figure out where the offset is, and we, I guess, could do that with GDB, of course. GDB, vuln, we use our pattern create. There is a crap ton of data, of course, the cyclic pattern that we might just give the program. So let's run this thing. It wants to know our string. I will paste in all of that jazz, and we see, oh, it broke, it crashed. Now, Jeff makes this nice and easy for us because, hey, we're looking at a 32-bit application, 32-bit binary. Our EIP, our extended instruction pointer, is the thing that's clobbered and filled, currently set to DAB. That's pretty hilarious. What we could do is we could use pattern search dollar sign EIP. Or I think it's pattern offset, right? Yeah, pattern offset. We found it offset 112. So let's jot that down in our code. Offset equals 112. And for the sake of our experimentation, let's try to do a pattern create 112. So I just have this string. And let's rerun the program one more time where I can enter our string and then slap in a CCC C at the bottom here. Now when I run this, sure we crash, but note my EIP is the CCC that I just entered. We know we have the sweet spot. We know we have the threshold. We do properly have the offset. And we know, ooh, we could just slap in the address of win. Yeah? Of that flag function. So hey, let's build out our payload. Just like we have previously, we'll do a join byte string. We'll wrap it in parentheses. We'll use a bytes of a times 112 and then we want a new eip right so new eip would equal the value that we get from our elf symbols win function because remember we don't have to hard code it anymore we don't need to use read elf because pwn tools will handle that for us super slick but remember that just gave us the decimal number or the hexadecimal number, however we want to represent it. That's not going to work. We need it in little endian. We could use that whole struct thing that we did earlier with struct.pack, but that was a good built-in way to do it in Python if you didn't have pwn tools. Now that we have pwn tools, there is a quick and easy convenience function for that. Let me search for packing. In util packing, this is a module for packing and unpacking integers. These are simplifying access to struct.pack and struct.unpack. It'll keep in mind little endianness or big endianness or whatever you really want here. You could use P8 to specify an 8-bit thing or P32 to specify a 32-bit number in integer. So the same way, ooh, check out how that is originally our little endian representation of a memory address like dead beef. P32 will do that super duper easy. All good. We could do that just as well. Let's use pwn P32. And I believe that's exposed right away. We don't need to use on and off uh, connections to uh, util or packing. It should just be able to behave. So if I run that, I pass it through. Is our new EIP going to work? I'll do this from the command line. Let me quit. I'll use Python 3 on our exploit. And ooh, it says, please enter your string, switch into your active mode, but no dice. It didn't really work for us. Did we do it right? Well, we didn't even send the payload for one thing. That probably isn't gonna work. Here, let's receive to print out the data that we were getting. Let's decode it as we did before, but let's go ahead and actually send our payload. And rather than sending like a new line character at the end of our payload, we can actually use send line, which is something that Pwn Tools makes super duper easy for us. We'll send line our payload. Now let's try and run this thing. 
da 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 da, -da. please enter your string. Hmm. Where are we going wrong? Well, should we receive something? Or should we actually have a new line character? Let's try and receive someone super quick. I'll just add that line in. Please enter your string. Nope, not having it. All right, let's add in a new line character and let's just use send rather than send line. That might do some other voodoo magic that I'm not knowing about. Try this one. Please enter your string. Still not coming through. What's going wrong? Is our new EIP right? Let's print that out. Please enter your string. That is right. Well, I know, hey, we are still trying to add in these arguments, but I would have expected it would yell at me, hey, printf, you need to create a flag.txt file before you can do any of this. I was kind of hoping that that would show for us, but I might be missing something else. What we could do is we could set a breakpoint and try and run this with GDB. Let's use GDB dot vom. Let's disass our vom function and let's do it right at the call. Yeah. So if I set a, a GDB attach statement in our process here, can I actually pass in a GDB init script with pwn tools? That way we could actually have it run commands. Yeah. Or just GDB on its own. I want to look for that. Working with GDB. Cool, cool, cool. Run a GDB attach. Where was that attach? Path to binary, GDB args. String process name. Ooh, GDB script. That's what it is. That allows you to do whatever you might like. Is that just GDB script as the argument? So a keyword argument, and they use the triple uh, double quotes here to denote a multi-line string. So I'll set a breakpoint at that address, and then I'll try and hit C to continue and actually let it run. Bla Sublime text black or Python black is trying to make this a little bit prettier and that makes it even messier, but hey, we'll let it, we'll let it go. Let's see, if I run this, how's it look? Opens up GDB, nice, and it broke somewhere. No debugging symbols, why did it break? Oh no, it hit the breakpoint, breakpoint at that address, which was kind of where we wanted to. Can I hit N to move forward, or P? No, it was, it was like way whack. Maybe GDB to do that is not something that I can just whip off the cuff. Forgive me. I am going to comment out uh, that GDB trick for the moment, uh, and we'll get back to what we were doing. Because, hey, we know that when we end up clobbering the instruction pointer, we will go to that function. We are going to call that win function. Uh, but right after it, following it on the stack is going to be the return address for that function, for the new one that we're calling, right? So once win is finished executing, where will it go next? Well, a safe way to, hey, maybe continue on the execution of the program is to just see, can we get it go back to, can we get it to go back to the main function? Like as if we started again. Um, so what we could do is we could just copy the new EIP line where we're grabbing the symbols for our win function. Maybe we could make it just go back to the main function for our own return address, yeah? So if I paste this in, I'll actually add a comment here so that's visible. And now I, I realize, oh, sorry, that doesn't have an equal sign at the end. So it's not adding on to it. It wasn't actually doing anything. Let's try to run with this. Please enter your string. No, no. Okay, did I, 
Was it running just fine without that for some reason? No. Okay, so let's add the plus equal sign and let's also use send line and see if that works. Please enter your string. You know what? Let's not receive any data and let's just let the send line run and let's let interactive take care of it. Let's see if the, that will cruise through. It does, it does. Okay, so take a look at what's happening here. It says, please send your string. When we switch to interactive mode, which kind of happened hey, in whatever order, we sent our big long payload, which sent the address of our win function that we want to get to, and then the address of our main function, which brings us back to the same prompt, please enter your string. That happened because it's on the stack and how that we're executing this. And actually, uh, what we could do in all reality is try and jerry-rig this thing so that we can actually debug this with GDB. Oh, and we also had an extra receive. Maybe that was the problem. We were receiving twice. And that's, yeah, that, that must have been why. Here, let me put this back for the moment and remove that receive we had up top. Then if we print the receive, it wouldn't hang on us. Yeah, okay, I'm just an idiot, that's all. Forgive me. And then our receive would probably just printed it out. Um, oh, did it have an issue? Oh, 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 it tried to decode the bytes, but it because it displayed the real bytes now, UTF-8 wouldn't be able to retrieve that. But Latin 1 will, so it's stupid. Encodings are dumb. Just send your payload and go interactive is my best advice to you. <laughs> I think that's the fairest thing. So, sorry, I know I'm, I'm, I'm flicking back and forth way too quickly. Um, what we can do is actually take our process and let's not spawn it until we've built out our payload here. And what we could do is we could actually write our payload to a file. So that way we could sort of hack together hey, let's use GDB and let's have it read in our payload and we can debug it as needed. So if we open the payload as a file pointer, uh, we could actually write the payload that we have. And that way, when we start the process, we could have GDB read and run our payload. And so we don't have to do this stuff and do it through the script. We can still debug it while we give it our payload. So sure, I won't set a breakpoint here, but I will go ahead and set like a... I'll set a breakpoint on the win function because we should hopefully be calling it, right? And then we'll continue onward. Uh, but we will actually, sorry, read in from our payload. So these are basically GDB commands that we're running just within our script in Python. Let's see if that works. I'm gonna hit control B. I'll fire this up and where are we at? Where are we at? Did we hit a breakpoint? Yes, we did. So check it out. Breakpoint one at this address in win. And you can see it right down here. We stopped at this address in win and we are at the very, very beginning of our win function. So we did in fact call it because of our payload. Now if I hit NI, there we go, for the next instruction, we can see, hey, we push EBP onto the stack. So EBP currently has the value of our A's. I'll hit NI for next instruction again. And now you can see that 414141 has been pushed onto the stack. We set EBP to ESP. So ESP is currently that thing. We set the exact same thing for EBP once I hit enter. I'll hit enter again. We do some magic pushing EBX onto the stack. We do some magic. Uh, and then, hey, it's gonna end up calling something to read stuff in. Hitting enter again for next instruction. Next instruction, next instruction, next instruction. You know we're gonna end up calling the fopen function to actually read in the flag.txt. Um, and did I get to the, so let me be honest, I had to kind of pause the recording and reorient myself because I was getting this way super wrong. Uh, if I didn't record the footage, and I for, forgive me, I totally forget. I was in CTF Pico, binary exploitation, uh, buffer overflow two, and I just echoed, hey, John, or like please subscribe into a flag.txt. So I created a local flag.txt for me to play with if I didn't already showcase that in, the, in this video here. 
So what that would mean is that we will in fact read this file. If I hit NI for the next instruction, and I'll, let me go back to my screen. Did I not show that literally whatsoever? <laughs> Here, uh, believe me, I was in CTF Pico binary station buffer overload two, and I had echoed a John, please subscribe into a flag.txt. I'm the worst, I'm sorry. I didn't even go back to show you that. Oh, and now I just closed that whole thing. This is a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We can just run the script and go back to it. So starting again at the tippy top of our win function, I'm going to hit NI a few times so I can next instruction, next instruction, next instruction, pass over the file open, and you can see, ooh, that would very well read in files. Uh, and here's what we do. Here's something that we do simple and strange and odd. We jump to some things to be able to read in our please subscribe flag. And then we compare what our EBP plus hex eight is against cafe food. That is our very, very first argument, right? That we wanted to be able to pass into this function. But what is our EBP plus hex eight right now. So let me type and an enter X to be able to examine that within GDB. I'll examine dollar sign EBP, dollar sign to reference that register, uh, plus zero X eight. Currently it's this stack value, right? So when I hit next instruction and I am currently at that compare instruction, it's probably going to fail. And it's actually is going to say, oops, that is not equal to zero, that compare instruction failed, so we are going to jump to the very, very end of this function, which brings us to, oops, okay, we'll hit NOP, oops, we'll jump to the very end, which is going to bring us to this instruction at win offset 157, sure, next instruction. We end up moving EBX to the address at EBP minus four. Now, what was that EBP? Minus four. Can I check that super quick? EBP minus zero X four. That was our A's. Uh, so do we go somewhere weird here? Let's check. Let me hit NI. Next instruction. Leave. That's going to end up doing some strange things to our uh, stack. But when we, by the time we hit RET, Red is going to return and bring us back to the very, very top location on our stack, which is main, because we entered that as our return address, thanks to our payload. So I the next instruction, and I, it brings us right back to main. So we know we do in fact have our main return address jump happening and working just fine. And it's cool to be able to see that in the debugger. But we know that we need to now check for our arguments. We need to pass in cafe food and food food. And the way that we read about how this worked on Wikipedia is that, okay, this needs things pushed on the stack uh, in reverse order, where food food would come first and cafe food would come next. But we are writing the stack in a, in a different direction, right? Because of how we end up putting together our own exploit. Because we have our instruction pointer and then its return address and then arguments. We grow the stack in one direction when it's reading it in the other direction. So we have to actually put these in the order that they're expected to be because of our binary exploitation technique, because of what we're doing here. So let me show you that. Let's go ahead and just do, yeah, pwn p32 to pack this thing, 0x cafe food. And then we need to do the same thing for food food, right, as the next argument. So when I run this, we're gonna fire up GDB one more time. We know we are hitting our breakpoint at the very, very top of the win function. Uh, and let's, to make things speedy, let's go ahead and disassemble our win function. And then it will go down and hop to check right where we're doing the comparisons. We're checking if EBP plus 
hex 8, BBP, EBP hex plus hex C are equal to these values. So let's go down and set a breakpoint on, I guess, our compare instruction. You know what? There's no sense going anywhere. So let's add a breakpoint with the asterisk of that memory address right for the compare instruction. Let's hit enter. And now let's continue until we hit exactly that breakpoint. Breakpoint two right here. You can see we have compare as our current instruction based off of our instruction pointer, thanks to Jeff. And now let's do that comparison. Let's actually examine the value. I'm using X again to examine. EBP plus hex eight. Currently, that is cafe food because of our exploitation, because of our script, because we said, sweet, we know the new address that we want to jump to. We're going to set a return address for it to trampoline back to once it's done. But the arguments to our win function that we're going to end up calling right up here are going to be in the order that is reversed to how they reversed it. So our natural arg1, arg2 structure, cafe food and food food. Does that make any sense? <laughs> I, uh, I know I made a, a big different background there. It's probably a little bit harder to read. So if I hit next instruction and I, now you can see Jeff says, hey, that was not taken because it's not zero. And that, hey, or, or well, not not zero. I don't know how exactly that's reading, but we were true. We were good. I think that's the not zero flag was set and that's when it would take it. So it's not not zero. One of those explanations forgive me uh yeah jump not equal to zero we know that we have met the criteria for that argument being correct and if i hit the next instruction again we don't take the jump we now examine what is our base pointer plus hex c that is food food which again meets this comparison and we won't jump we do not take the return function. We do not bail out. We continue onwards and we finally end up calling the printf function with the argument of our flag. If I scroll up, now that will be present and displayed output on the screen and we have our working exploit and we were able to debug it and make sense of it all thanks to Jeff. That was some of the good quick troubleshooting the way that we learned. Uh, we jump to the very end of this function, we leave, we know we end up going to calling back to our main function, and that's where we are. We're now back in main. Perfect. So let's quit out of the debugger. Let's get back to our script here, or our terminal, and let's go ahead and run our exploit.py. We don't need to attach this to GDB anymore, but we can go ahead and actually send this payload to the process that we run and make it interactive. So we're no longer going to debug with our payload, but we can just fire it off. And there is our flag. We have finally put together that good exploit script. Now, the reason we had some fun doing this in uh, GDB, or excuse me, and because we were doing this within Pwn Tools is so that we could determine whether or not we were building and preparing a local exploit versus a remote exploit. So let me check. We imported arg parse for a reason, and we kept it. We said, hey, let's keep track of our own arg parser. So parser is going to be arg parse, argument parser. This is the same boilerplate code that we've written in the previous one. But let's go ahead and add an argument. We can say, uh, uh, yeah, let's do remote, or I guess host and port. Or what should we do? Should we make these optional? How can we do that? Arg parse uh, optional arguments. Hmm. Or just, I guess, we can call it destination. How about that? <laughs> it sounds pretty dumb, uh, but I guess it, we could make it limit to two options. Is there a way to do that? Arg parse limit to. Restricting values of command line options. Ooh, that's got a way to do it. Choices. That's the way. How about that? Does it have to be int? No. 
Does it need it as a set? Maybe. Let's do type to be string. Uh, that needs to be literal str, sorry. And then choices can equal local or remote. How about that? So args can equal parser dot um, parse args. And let me just go ahead and print out our args destination. Because I just kind of want to see it. Python 3 exploit. Okay, it does need a destination versus local or remote. We can say local, in which case it'll just return the value. So we could check at the very, very end of this, if args destination is equal to local, then we'll do it locally. And ultimately we're gonna end up sending the same payload one way or the other. Um, we could also do an L if args dot destination is equal to remote. Uh, but I would like to pass in other arguments like the host and port number host. And that would be a string. Can we do that if and only if another argument exists? Uh, Meh. I think default would have to be what it is. Port. And that can be an integer. How about that? Does that work? Otherwise, we'll end up using a pwn tools remote functionality. And that remote will allow us to pass in, hey, what is the host and port that you want to connect to? It's basically like args uh, or, or socket connect, but you don't have to do all the boilerplate that comes with it. And we can kind of script this in a quick and easy way. Although ultimately we end up sending our payload and writing this all out. So let's see if that works for us. Oh, here, I'll, uh, minim I'll, I'll shrink this down so you can see, wow, this is our nice fancy script here to be able to exploit this thing. And if I were to run this thing locally, oh, it does need it. How do I set those to be optional? Arg parse optional arguments? Is it not just setting a default? Optional. Mm. Oh, required. I guess that's it. Yeah. Whatever. Required equals false on those. What? Required is an invalid argument for positionals? Oh, okay. So we have to make those like tag tag host or tag I guess target would be a better word then so you're not using tag h maybe that's a fine way to do it why do you have to be position you can't use it for positionals hmm I'm probably structuring that in some bad way and I'm, I'm sure anyone else watching or listening in will will let me know how I could do that better Anyway, we'll use tag tag port and tag p. And with that, can we use local? What? Oh, yeah, it needs an actual int, not just a string. <laughs> How about that? There we go. It runs locally and it works. So we're good. How if we try to do this with remote? Namespace has no argument to host. Yep, that's because we changed it to target. Um, and we should probably check on what those are, but it will yell at us. Could not resolve host name one way or the other. So yeah, it'll totally die if that doesn't work. So we should check if args.target 
or args.port. If they don't exist, so like an if not on those, we should um, exit for one thing and like actually print supply target and port as a quick error. Stupid Dumbo, maybe it works. Supply target and port, yeah. We could actually use the cool pwn tools like error on that, or pwn.fatal, I think. Supply tag T for target and tag P for port. How does that look? No, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. Is it error? Error. Yeah, okay, so that'll kill. I, I want it to probably do a warning and not, and then exit cleanly though. There we go. Okay, that looks a little bit nicer. Sorry. <laughs> I know we had some back and forth and now we're gonna have to restart the instance all along. But with that, we have significantly improved our scripting prowess. And do we even need to pass in those? Yeah, it's not gonna be able to know positionally which is frustrating but boom <laughs> maybe we could keep playing with our arguments if we really wanted to get like super finicky about it but honestly i think that was more than enough torture for this one video um we we extrapolated this significantly longer than we needed to uh, but We've using pwn tools. We have learned how we can structure the stack for calling conventions on 32-bit processes and binaries. Uh, we've stuck the thing together with GDB and Jeff so we can do a little bit better debugging when we're getting to some other shenanigans. And with that, we honestly can, hey, create our get flag script with this. We can do grep, tac, oe, pico, ctf, um, and do we even need p.interactive anymore? Not gonna lie, I don't think we do. We, we should do a p.receive all though, so we can actually grab our, our binary uh, and flag. Let's see if this turns it out for us. Uh, does not, what's our error here? Receive all, oh, you know what? We should probably print it out, imagine that. And then we can decode it as needed. And will that actually work or will it error? Yep, it'll whine about some of the uh, specific bytes that it was showcasing. So rather than UTF-8, let's use Latin 1 as our encoding and, and churn all that out. Blah. Okay, perfect. So now we can see the weird oddball bytes uh, and we can get the last flag at the end and we can cut through this even if we were doing it locally hey, we get our own flag, but we want to do it remotely and we want to grep out our Pico CTF flag. It'll cleanly exit. And with that, we have our get flag scripts. Oh, I didn't even save it. Come on, what happened? What, oh, 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 I needed to get back into buffer overflow two. Let's run this thing again, save our script and our flag, and with that, we have this challenge done. Uh, so, goodness, holy crap, everybody, I'm super sorry. I feel like, look, I mean, the fact, so I had to pause, I had to stop, I had to get my bearings and like figure this out and actually do it right, because I kept fumbling, and there will be a, an edit, there will be a quick cut to like save you from that torture, but... I hope there were still a lot of really good learning lessons in this, whether it's, hey, using Pwn tools um, and being able to interact with that remote socket in a quick and easy way, using arg parse to be able to determine whether or not you're doing a local exploit or a remote one, and then hooking it up with GDB so that you can still debug the payload that you're building out um, with Jeff, of course, and then knowing ultimately the whole learning lesson of this was that how you can control the arguments, how you can control the calling conventions of a 32-bit application in a program. Sure, you can control the instruction pointer, but you can also determine where it goes next with the return address that just follows it on the stack, and then the arguments, right, that'll again follow them on the stack. And while, sure, stack normally puts them in reverse order, they're gonna look in like normal order to us as we're 
building it out <laughs> on our own stack to exploit this thing and perform the buffer overflow. So a little bit of a different ball game, a little bit of idiosyncrasies and gimmicks in there, but I really, really hope there was some good learning lessons and I'm sorry this took forever, but I hope you learned something new. <laughs> I'm gonna stop talking to everybody. I think I gotta go to bed. <laughs> I think I gotta take it easy. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. If you like this video, please do all those YouTube algorithm things. I would love if you could like the video, comment, subscribe, support, share, etc. I love you. I'll see you in the next video. Take care.